Good. Good morning, Fellowship Church. That's a nice song, Angels We Have Heard on High. And we're going to hear some angels that are speaking to Daniel, or not him, Nebuchadnezzar, this morning, too. Uh, I'll open with a word of prayer, then we'll get right into the scripture. Daniel chapter 4. Lord God, we thank you that you give us a conversion testimony when we're saved. And that King Nebuchadnezzar had this testimony that we may learn from this, the shadows and types that this king represented and how you had mercy upon him in his proudness and how you still, as an eternal God and the God that changes not, we must humble ourselves before you. Speak to our hearts now through this lesson. In the name of your Son, amen. We're looking at Daniel chapter 4, the miracles and prophecies of Daniel. The greatest miracle is their 100% uncompromised heart. The inward working of God in their life of him and his three friends in chapter 1. That is the greatest miracle you're ever going to see. And continually, that changes not. The converted life, the life that is following God in the Old Testament and the New Testament is going to produce this type of character and desires to know what's right or wrong, discern the difference, and make the choice, I'm going to follow God. I'll obey God and not man, looking for his ways. And then the prophecies, you can't help mixing in the prophecies because King Nebuchadnezzar, the greatest king in Babylon, will bring us back to the Tower of Babel in Nimrod, in Genesis 10 and 11, then it will bring us to the old Babylonian Empire, the new Neo-Babylonian Empire, where he's the greatest king that lived. And then even to the future, the destruction of Babylon in Revelation chapter 17 and 18. So you can't help it being prophetic. This man, this king, at this time, looking in the past and connecting this city of Babylon to the future. The same as Jerusalem. The whole Bible is a tale of two cities. And we'll look at first a time and a place. Daniel's around 46 years old. And it's 584 BC, seven years after chapter 3. We go chapter by chapter and don't have a perspective of the time in between. But we do know that Nebuchadnezzar, he ruled 43 years. And Daniel was with him in Babylon that whole 43 years plus longer until Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belshazzar, the last of the kings of Babylon unto Cyrus, the next king of Persia. We know that Nebuchadnezzar was one year plus seven, and it continues 14 years to reign before a natural death. He didn't die of violence or an overtake. God's hand was upon Nebuchadnezzar. The prophet Jeremiah says, he's my servant. He was used by God for a purpose to bring judgment on God's people for their disobedience. And Jeremiah three times says, he is my servant. And we're going to see his conversion testimony in chapter 4 of Daniel. It's very similar to the conversion testimony in, of Paul in Acts 26 when we said, what is my testimony? 
and we had testimony Sunday. That was an oral testimony before others. This one is a memo from the king to his empire, all peoples, nations, and languages. The place is Babylon. It's about 225 square miles, the largest city in the world at this time. And we'll go more into that city in chapter 5 next week. Key words are pride and a base. And then there's a great tree that's made into a stump. It's cut off. There's a heart of an animal that's given to Nebuchadnezzar to humble him. And he'll eat grass like an animal for seven years. Key words are king and kingdom used 13 times each. Heaven and earth, 15 and 10 times. And a key phrase for repentance of this king is his sins were replaced by righteousness. And then his iniquities are replaced by mercy to the poor. This is the evidence of a true testimony. And we'll start out the next slide in verses 1 to 3 of chapter 4. Well, let's turn to chapter 4. We'll read some verses, but due to lack of time, we're not going to read it through. I trust that you have read it ahead of time, or you take the notes and you read it afterwards to get the best, the most out of this teaching of what the scriptures say and then how it applies to our life today, to your life and my life today. Verses 1 to 3 of chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar the king unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. He started out his conversion testimony as a memorandum, official kingdom letter to everyone in the kingdom. And the word peace, he knows peace which he didn't have before. A peace that passes understanding, which we all have access, is our conversion testimony. We'll have a peace that will be more and more consistent in our lives as we obey God. And when we as Christians disobey God, that peace leaves, departs us. So these are all evidence of a true conversion. The introduction and the last verses of chapter 4. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders, his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And his dominion is from generation to generation. Then let's go to the finish, because now he's going to talk about the background. And he has a dream and visions that he doesn't know what to do with. And he requests Daniel to interpret. Then Daniel tells the interpretation And he still doesn't change until after a year. Then he's humbled for seven years. Then we get to the end. Let's go right to the end, verses 43 to 47, because I want to emphasize that he is saved. Not something, oh, we don't really know if he's saved. Who knows his heart? We know it is by the words he says and coordinating it with what does it say about salvation in the New Testament? So let's see. Verse, verse 34. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, this is after seven years being an animal with the animal's heart out in the field. I lifted up my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned. He had... How did it return? 
He's like, if you would perchance say, the prodigal son. The prodigal son had an inheritance. God prophesied or, or said, you've been ordained since the foundation of the world, but he wanted the experience of the world. And he left. And then he came to his senses and returned to the father. I say that Nebuchadnezzar is like this, that God's hand was upon him all the time from his birth, that Jeremiah said, he's my servant, and he accomplished God's will, but he was the greatest king that ever lived, the head of gold, and that he's returning better than he was before because he comes to the true God. And he doesn't come through Judaism. He doesn't come to the law. He comes to the God in heaven. Mentions nothing about the word Lord or Jehovah. None of the terms you expect. It uses the terms that you would expect in the New Testament. Understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and I praised and honored Him that lives forever. Whose dominion is an everlasting dominion and His kingdom is from generation to generation. Same thing he said in verse 3b. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And today the same. All the people of the earth are as nothing compared to the God in heaven. We're as nothing. And that's part of humbling ourselves before the God of heaven and not letting pride get into us. As believers, we can look at We'll look at that more as we go through how this happened in this king's heart and how it happens in our heart as a believer and also in unbelievers. It's pride coming in and you pass the point of no return. And you're going to suffer the consequences. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth his will, and none can stay his hand. What he has predetermined, what's prophesied, 25% of the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, are prophecies. Tell them what's going to happen ahead of time. That's why the scholars and the intellectuals say Daniel couldn't have been written 600 B.C. It was 100 B.C. He couldn't have told all these empires and future things. It's impossible. Yes, it is, without the true God in heaven that has a plan, a beginning and end, and a purpose that all men will glorify Him. Or say unto Him, What doest thou? Nobody can. Even Job recognized that. And Elihu. And at the same time, my reason, his understanding and reason, return unto me. And the glory of my kingdom, my honor and righteous brightness, return to me. If we go away from God's plan or we're out of it, when we come to him, these things return. And even more, they flourish. They grow in abundance. God's continually saying to Israel as a nation, Turn to me. Return to me. One of the two. And he's saying to us today, if we're not in the high calling of God, turn to me or return to me. And that's repentance. The true work of repentance. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and brightness return unto me. That's the joy of the Lord, the peace that passes all understanding. And my counselors and my lords sought unto me again. Because those seven years he was an animal, we'll look over what archaeology tells us about those seven years. It's very revealing what happened in his mind, in his heart, during that seven years that it took to humble him to come to the true God, the God most high, the God in heaven. And I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. 
If he was great before, now he's greater as a king with God on his side, knowing what's right. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. He's recognizing the king of kings. The king that was with him during the fire in chapter 3 of his three friends of Daniel. And what are the three things? All whose works are one, truth. What is true? There is a truth and there's lies. What is true is what is written. And his ways, judgment. It's a good thing to judge rightly. The right way, right time. And those that walk in pride, he is able to abase, to make low. Now, in between this, verses 26 and 27 tells us what his sins were, the kings. And whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the root, tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure to thee, after thou hast known that the heavens do rule. The God in heaven rules. He's in control. He will raise and lower kings and kingdoms according to his glory and his time, to his judgment. Wherefore, O king, verse 27, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee. This is Daniel's counsel to the king who he's been with since he was a young king. And now it's around 35 years later. Two things. Break off thy sins by righteousness. The king had many sins that he was ignorant of. And until he was humbled by God, he didn't come aware of them. So he said, break off your sins by righteousness. Sins that we do in ignorance. And, second, thine iniquities. The difference between a sin and iniquity is sin we do by ignorance or part of learning to do what's right. But iniquity is more severe. We know it's right and still do what's wrong. <laughs> by showing mercy to the poor. I mean, they had millions. Much of the population were slaves. Much of the population were poor. And those that were the elite with the king and his government positions had the wealth, the land. There were many poor. So to show mercy to the poor was one of the sins he had to deal with as a king over the kingdom and his position. It may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. If your Bible says prosperity, cross it out, replace it with tranquility, peace, because this fits the context of chapter 4. Newer versions replace that with prosperity, the last word, instead of tranquility. And he was blessed. After this, he probably lived around 14 years before he died in peace in his home. And I want to read some archaeological proof and history proof what was going on in Nebuchadnezzar's life when he was an animal for seven years. In 350 BC, the Greek historian Megasthenes said he was possessed by some god. Well, yeah, he was possessed by the god of heaven, and he didn't accept all the other gods they had before. He came to one true god. Instead of making God in his own image, which he had as the beast, or the, the great image in chapter 3, I'm sure he destroyed that and melted it down and used for other purposes when he realized, I'm not God. Don't worship me. There's a God in heaven to worship. And then what else? The eventual downfall of Babylon, the Greek historian that wrote later, 
was probably because he gave to the poor now. And he helped the poor. And it wasn't all going to the rich. And they took that as part of a downfall, but really it was a blessing. How man's eyes sees things in God's eyes are really in contrast. And then, in the, according to Daniel, uh, a cuneiform tablet, 18 lines, was published in the British Museum in 1975, a recent archaeological discovery. And on the lines it writes, his life appeared of no value to him. When a person has the heart of an animal, and that's where our heart goes, the more we get into sin, it turns animal-like, not God-like. And it will be, these things are fulfilled that. His life appears of no value. They're not afraid of death because their heart is cold like an animal. They behave and act like animals. And the more sin is on the world, it'll be more animalistic, more violence. And then you need more government control. That's the way it works. What else did he see in this 18 lines? He speaks bad counsel to evil Merodach. That's his son. Then he gives an entirely different order. There's confusion about his orders. He could talk when he was in the seven years out in the field eating grass and had uh, as an animal. He does not heed the words of his own lips. Yes, there will be lies and confusion and, and lack of consistency. He does not show love to his son and daughter. Yes, that's one of the signs. The family unit is broken with his animal heart, animalistic. His family and clan do not exist. And I've seen that many times with someone that's got into a strong sin. They don't have no courtesy or respect to keep any contact with their parents, especially if they're Christian or they're evangelistic. They, they really hate that way because they have given themselves to sin, especially of sodomy and the sexual type sins. What else? He weeps bitterly to Marduk. That was the God of gods. He's still praying and seeking his God, but where is he? His prayers go forth. Those things reveal what others were thinking of him that, do, that did not know the true God, the God in heaven. So let's look a little bit at the background and the, the dream and visions. What's the difference between a dream and vision? A key passage, which, let's see, it's in the book of Job, chapter 33. It talks of Elihu in chapter 33 of Job talks of dreams and visions because God will speak in many ways to bring man to repentance. So I never heard of this, but it makes a lot of sense. And as I look through different commentaries or hear people speaking, Chuck Missler brought this out. So Job chapter 33 the first of the book of poetry after the um, books of history. Towards the end of the book, when the fourth friend of Job speaks up, verse 14 to 16, and you can read later to 18 as the full context. This section talks of God calls man to repentance in many different ways. For God speaks once, yea, twice, yet man perceives it not. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men and slumberings upon the bed, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction. Why? That he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. This is exactly what he did to Nebuchadnezzar. 
He had those dreams and visions at night to hide pride and reveal his need for repentance. Although, don't take that too far today. Some churches that are more charismatic have seminars on dreams and interpreting dreams, on prophecies and prophets. This is going too far. This was in the Old Testament. And in the early church before the scripture were finished, and it's not for today and generally. Or else we're going to get out of line. Still, they could be brothers and sisters in Christ. But it's not the way that we need to follow Christ the best way. And that is through Scripture alone. It is sufficient. Jesus alone is sufficient. And we go look for these other things and chasing after them. And in the emotionalism, we're going to be off in our own lives. Now let's look at back to Daniel chapter 4. Verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. So it doesn't it sound, oh my, he's at rest and flourishing, health, wealthy, everything's going well. I mean, it sounds like his gods are blessing him. And I saw a dream which made me afraid. And the thoughts upon my bed and the visions on my head troubled me. Therefore I made a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon to know the interpretation of the dream. None of them, such as Daniel too, and saw the, the image of the beast with the head of gold, could interpret it. Verse 8, Then he requests Daniel who had the ability to interpret dreams, whose name was Belshazzar. He gives him both his Hebrew name and his Chaldean name out of respect for him now. He recognizes the God of Israel, of, of Daniel, by talking, this is Daniel too, not just the name I gave him. Wait. And also his three friends are never mentioned after chapter 3, only Daniel. According to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. It uses the word holy. Separated on the God. Special, unique. That's how God looks at all his children. Especially in the New Testament. But in the Old it was something that the prophets desired to look into. They were holy, but they didn't understand Jesus. And also the angels in 1 Peter chapter 1, 10 and 12, they desired to look into, but couldn't. That is a gift that we have today to be able to understand these mysteries through the Scripture, through the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Christ, the hope of glory. Even Jesus said, in Luke 10, 21 to 22. Don't marvel that you're, these, you're the demons and you do miracles. No, your names are written in the book of heaven, the book of life. And he's revealed these things to the simple. They were hid before. And God's revealing the same things to everybody in Christ today. That was Jesus' prayer. And Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 26 to 21. He takes the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Do you say yourself foolish? Well, yes. <laughs> I do, I know. I'm not well educated from youth, raised in a family for that intellect, but God's grace and mercy upon me has given me ability to reason, to understand, and to obey the God in heaven and give peace as we do it. And bless. So he said uh, that one. Christ has become our redemption, our s wisdom and sanctification. And there's one more. I forget. Well, four things. It's really Christ in us. It's sufficient. Fulfilled all these things. We just have to learn how to let Christ live in us. Less of ourselves, more of him. 
That's learning to get the pride out of the way, I be my, to give God the glory and put Christ first in all ways, all times, more and more. We're not perfect till when? We're raptured. But what used to be a big sin will turn into a little sin, and what used to be our weaknesses will become our strengths as we grow in Christ, as He grows in us. Let's look again at this, more at this dream. He told him the dream in verses 8 to 12, and then verse 13, the vision. What's the difference between a dream and a vision? They were both at night on the king's bed. Well, a dream will show a series of actions. And a vision will be just an instant picture of something, and it goes away. But verse 13, I saw in the visions on my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher, that word watcher, and a holy one came down from heaven. These were angels. Now this some um, conspiracy or wig nuts will say watchers. That's a special group of people that are always watching us. No, they're special. These watchers are angels, a way that the king would describe them is, and they showed the vision. So there's two parts, the dreams and the visions. A holy one from heaven came down, and then he cried aloud, and he said, hew down the tree, and cut off the branches, shake off his leaves, scatter his fruit, let the beasts get away from under it, and the falls from the branches. So this tree, this great tree, which was humongous in his dream, the angels tell him, get away from it. It's going to be cut off. That is the seven years that he's going to talk about his judgment. Verse 16, let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him. And let seven times pass over him. Seven years. Seven times. And why is this judgment given to him? Verse 17. That the living, the people on earth, would, may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom on earth. Even today we have presidents, we have emperors, czars, those are kings today. But God has raised them up or puts them down according to his glory, to his plan. And we don't need to be concerned where we are in this cycle of kingdoms and empires. We just know that God is the one that will raise or lower kings and kingdoms. Why? Whomsoever he will, he will give it and sets up over at the basis of men. He's going to have this man, that's a great king, well known, turn into an animal for seven years. The basis of men. So this was for God's prophecy ahead of time. It was a fulfillment of prophecy. Why do I say that? Because there's going to be another great king come in the future from Jerusalem, that will be like the king of Babylon, and he'll have a 666 that want everybody to bow down and worship before him. Although there's no mercy for this king, he'll be completely evil, filled with Satan and Lucifer, come down, and there'll be a false, what you call the beast of the sea and the beast of the land, Revelation 13. Why do they call them beasts? Because they don't have no heart. No regard for others in what you would think the Christians, the Bible promotes this to help the poor, to, to how to love one another through Christ in the times we're in. Not to judge, but to judge rightly. So Nebuchadnezzar has the mercy of God upon him. It's prophesied. But the next king that rises... Over Babylon, he's not prophesied to do well, but to do evil. 
and intense evil with all the forces of his angels and the wicked ones and the deception that will run wild throughout the whole earth. And now we're in the times, as it gets closer, there will be a great falling away in the church. We'll be in a time where there's easy to get the mixture of this world with God's plan for his people, mixing it. Now in verse 19, he asked, Daniel interprets the dream for him. The last part of verse 19, My Lord, the dream be to them that hate you, and interpret thereof to your enemies. The dream was terrible. He didn't want to tell the king. Him and the king were best friends. He was second in rule to the kingdom. Daniel was lifted. They respected one another. The king said, tell me anyways, even if it's to my own hurt, I know, I trust you, Daniel. The speed of trust among the king and Daniel. Go to verse 22. He tells him about this dream and the falls of heaven, the great tree. And he says, it is you, O king, that art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reaches unto heaven and thy dominion to the end of the earth. That's the first part of the dream he interprets. And then he interprets the vision that the angels gave him, verses 23 to 27. I'm going to just read verse 26, 27. Let my counsel... Wait. Verse 26. Thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee, and thou that thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. He's saying you're not going to lose the kingdom. It's going to be restored to you. But you have to go through this insanity for seven years first. You have to be humbled before I exalt you again. Verse 27. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee. We read that earlier. To break off from his sins and his iniquities to help the poor. And I'll say again, he doesn't say nothing about Judaism, converting to the law of the Jews. And even today, if we think, oh, I'm going to go back to holy days and festivals or these things, we're going towards a weakness. It's not for today. Christ has fulfilled all the ceremonial laws. Acts 10 and 15 talk about that. The change from Judaism to the new way through Christ. He has new wine for us today. We're to be new bottles that the new wine can be poured into. The New Testament. And when does that begin? In effect, practically, was when the Holy Spirit was given to them. In the book of Acts chapter 2. And then there was that transition throughout the book of Acts. The key application is James chapter 4, verse 7 to 10. How does this apply to us? Pride and being abased. What other kings were like King Nebuchadnezzar when he looked out and saw the kingdom and was full of peace and prosperity? There was a king called Herod in Acts chapter 12. And he spoke and the people says, he speaks as a God. He has great eloquence. He could speak well. He could manipulate people through his speech. And what happened? God judged them immediately and the worms came and he died. So that's one example of a king that had pride, the same as Nebuchadnezzar before he was humbled. But he didn't have the mercy to return to God. He died right away. But there's another king that we all know the same thing happened. And his name was David. He said that when he looked on his kingdom and he considered what God had gave to him, and then what did he do when he saw all these glories and great things of his kingdom? He took 
many more wives unto himself. And we know that was of his great fall later, a couple years later, his sin with Bathsheba and murder of Uriah. That sin, sexual sin, got David. And we learn lessons from the Old Testament. And the New Testament gives us greater resources than David had. Greater resources than the prophets had. And the angels desire to look into. So let's be New Testament Christians and get that new wine, the sound doctrine, the foundation of our faith, and build upon it. And have that, our bottles be that new bottles that that new wine can be poured into. And it will eventually be overfilling to others. That is part of my vision for 2023, looking at the year ahead. You know, December is last month of our 12-month calendar, looking for the new year. And I say, Christmas is exciting and all, but to me, I see it as exciting as I'm able to live another year and prepare for it and seek the Lord for his, what he has for the next year ahead. So I bring that into this James chapter 4, verse 7 to 10, what we look for application for today. The strongest verse in the New Testament, the most clear to believers. This was one of the verses that helped me get out of a cultic group called the Children of God. I was saved, but still within a false prophet's teachings that helped me come out of it. So 1 Peter, or James, chapter 4, verse 7 and 10. This is what happened in Nebuchadnezzar's life. James, just before Hebrews. Breaking in a new Bible so it doesn't get there real quick. Just after Hebrews, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's it. James, just after Hebrews. It's the first of the non-Pauline epistles. James, chapter 4, verse 7 to 10. And I had it memorized, and I do refresh myself sometimes. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Amen. So we must submit before we can resist. That's the order. <laughs> so submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Whatever you're going through, submit ourselves to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But we must flee from sin <laughs> to resist and submit ourselves to God. Draw near to God. He doesn't change. We're the ones that are always changing. We're not the same. The same yesterday, today. And no, no. We as believers are changing. We should be. And if we aren't, See, God, this, this applies to our lives. And I know I'm going to have to do it more through December to prepare for 2023. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. He's always near. We have gone a little bit away in different ways. We have got cold. The world's come in our own ways, our own time. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purification. Water cleanses the filth, the dirtiness. And purify your hearts, ye double-minded. We don't need to be, should I do this or that? And more and more, yes, this is the right thing to do, and I'm going to do it. Follow through by faith. By faith is how we follow through. Then the feelings will come. Not, I don't really feel like it, and we do things by faith, not by feelings. The feelings, the feeling of the Spirit comes later, not that it comes before and we feel like it or not. Through obedience, through the Word. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. No one else needs to see us. 
This some we do alone. And he will lift you up. As the prophecy was to the king, as a king, the tree that was cut down, John the Baptist said it very clear. We are trees, individuals, that he deals with in the New Testament. He says, the axe is laid at the root of the trees, Matthew 3.10. And every tree which brings forth not good fruit, you should know them by their fruit, is hewn down and cast into the fire. Now, we don't have the fear as being God's children cast into the fire. But the fire of the judgment seat of Christ and not having the works, good works, because of our salvation, not to be saved, because we're saved, we don't enjoy the Lord as we could in this life. We want to enjoy Him as we walk after His Spirit, His ways, in His time. So this is a great challenge for 2023. Next week we go into Daniel chapter 5. The handwriting on the wall. If you want to read ahead, no time for questions and answers today, but if you want to, another time or any time I'm available after this service. God bless. Lord, be with the service, the music, and the message. Have mercy on us. Speak to our hearts according to your holiness, to your love. Amen. Talk to my wife, she said. Don't bother me right now, I'm watching Bill. <laughs> she is having fun. Yeah. Yeah, she's still recovering. She's doing good.
miss your house decorations? Um, I want to see it. We had it one year. We had lights, um, lights here outside. Huh? And then our electric bill oh, was so high. We're not just. Um, I don't know if he did get it or his family, but he asked for prayer. So. He should be coming. See, they we're inconsistent when we start. That's why people are confused. Oh. I would just go with... You should just start at 11 like you're supposed to start. Yeah, but then there's a space between Sunday school and service. They need to figure out something to put online well, where I mean, people like are space. waiting where people are waiting instead of I, don't, I thought that's what Tyson does the space in between the space yeah but there's nobody here with Bago in the mid nuts So maybe online they should present something. I would go for just 11, consistent. I'll just tell Brother Billy can talk longer. I'm sure you like that. Hey, Liv. Hola, Juliana. Good morning, Fellowship Church. I want uh, Pastor Marvin to walk around and check everybody else's cell phone. And if they're on, let's stand and sing the rest of the people in. We start with uh, carols today, Christmas carols, since we're on the first Sunday of December. Angels we have heard on high Sweetly singing o'er the plains And the mountains in reply Echoing their joyous strains Gloria In excelsis Deo some tidings be which inspire your heavenly song Gloria in ex 
excelsis Deo. Christ's birth, the angels sing. Come adore on bended knee. Christ the Lord, the newborn King. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Praise Mary, Joseph, lend your reign while our hearts in love we raise. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Please be seated. Do you know the meaning of Gloria in Excelsis Deo or are you just singing it? What does it mean? <laughs> Glory to God in the highest. Okay. Gloria in Excelsis Deo. Pastor Marvin. Amen. Thank you, brother. All right. Well, we want to welcome you all to Fellowship Church. We're going to look over our prayer list. And uh, we're seeing great answers to prayer. Let's look. We're going to pray for Garnett Anderson and her son, Brian. We're going to pray for uh, Cheryl and her husband, Angelo. The Larkin family. Um, Melissa Seacrest. Debbie Boer. Ken and Lorraine Mahan. Also for um, Ella Mason and Evan. Also for Terry Apperson and Linda Medora. She's in the hospital, by the way, has pneumonia, praying for her. I believe she's looking to get out on Monday. Ashley Enstrom uh, and her son, Aiden. Also for Jerry and Linda Muchow. Uh, also for uh, Delia Shantry, Josh Bozeman, Jean Mathow. Kathy saw us saw her Friday. She's doing very well. Uh, Michelle Sullivan, Kim Beluzzi, Tom Watson, uh, James Dorsey, also for Caleb Bailey, James Sherbert, uh, Dana Brown, and Jesse Gilroy, also praying for Linda Grady, Brenda Boyd, Otis Feld, uh, also praying for Robin McDonough, Carol DeHaven, good to see her here today, Becky Cheney, also for Kimberly Harris, Betty Stepp, the Kocheski family. Donna's sister, Dodie, uh, has COVID, praying for her. Uh, Ginger and A.J. Konigan, also for Brenda Greer. The Malberg family, good to see them today. Rose Younger, good to have her back in the back. James, uh, Jim Bice Jr., Sr., I'm sorry, uh, praying for him. I'm going to have an operation, I believe, this coming week. Robert Cole. Marissa Crown, good to see her here today. Um, Katina Mattingly and Paul. Joseph and Kelly, praying for them. Maria Jones and her son Chuck, both with cancer. Joseph Owens, also for Tom Flaherty. My wife Donna, doing very well at home. I believe the doctor said in three weeks she'll be able to take her sling off. Uh, Helen Cooper, out in Bowie. Uh, Jeremy and Amy. Amy here today? All right. Vince Jane and Junior and his family. Savannah Hardesty, also for Alan Mary Jane Mills. 
Pastor Gary Snyder, I'm so thrilled. I hear he's doing very well. Praying for him, love him to death. Praying for Pam Hooper, uh, Jeremy and Cass Heath, Ika Remo, also Betty Remo, I understand, is under the weather today. Praying for her. The San Chusi, I can never say that name right, family. Renee Miller had operation this past week. Praying for her. Also praying for our dear friend, Freddy Krueger, uh, and the loss of his wife, I believe yesterday morning. Uh, Elsie went home to be with the Lord. So praying for her family. Also praying for uh, Israel Remo and the military. Also for Tim Harmon. Also for Jacob Houston. Uh, Ashley Baldo. Bill Heath in the Army. Uh, Anthony Baldo, Army. Also for Charles Burke, Army. And Brandon Hardesty, Marines. And we're also praying for uh, Dominic. And getting ready to go to Texas in a couple months, right? February? Amen. I love telling that story. We, I was in um, Fort Hood years ago, and the temperature was 117 the whole time we were there. Uh, good luck. <laughs> I'm just kidding you. <laughs> what a blessing. Lord, we love you, and we just thank you for our people. And Lord, we just uh, pray your blessings on this time as we pray. As our people take these prayer requests home uh, and pray for these people, Lord, we thank you for the answers to prayer. We love you, Lord Jesus. And we ask this in your precious holy name. Amen. Thank you, thank you Pastor Marvin. Please stand with us. We're going to read a portion of Romans chapter 8 before we... Continue to praise the Lord in songs this morning. Together, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. May the Lord add more blessings to the reading of his holy word. Go tell it on the mountain. Go tell it on the mountain over the hills and Everywhere, go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching, or silent flocks by night, behold, throughout the heavens there showed a holy light. and everywhere go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born down in our spirit and truth when low above the earth rang out the angel chorus that hailed our 
Savior's blood. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Down in a lowly manger, the humble Christ was born and brought us God's salvation, the blessed Christmas morn. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. That Jesus Christ is born. Amen. Jesus, name above all names. Beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, blessed Redeemer, living Lord of the universe, light of the world, Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel. Blessed Redeemer, living Word. O oh, come, let us adore Him. O oh, come, let us adore Him. O oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, Father, Lord, we thank you and we praise you once again for this beautiful day that you have given us. We thank you for our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for this season, reminding us of the precious gift that you have given to us, your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, as we come before your throne of grace once again this morning, we plead for the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and make us worthy to worship you today. Thank you for the voices that you have given us so we can lift up the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for this place that you have provided for us. We thank you for waking us up this morning to see the newness of life 
and your creation. And so we welcome your Holy Spirit once again in our midst. May he move in each one of us. Open our hearts and minds, Lord, as we prepare to receive the blessings from your Holy Word. We thank you for eternal life and for that blessed hope we have in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, blessed Redeemer, living Word. Shepherd, vine of the branches, Son of God, Prince of Peace, Wonderful Counselor, Lord of the Universe, Light of the World, oh, seated. As uh, Debbie comes, I'd like to remind everyone to please turn your cell phones off and let's uh, worship the Lord together without any distraction this morning. Miss Debbie. Thank you, Mr. Ray. Happy Sunday, everyone. I see our mama to be made it here today. Bless her heart. So don't forget, we're having a baby sprinkle right after church. And so, Mr. Ray, we're going to cut the cake and you guys from the... Um, Choir can come in and join us real quick, and we'll present the gift, and then you guys can be on your way. How's that? They can join the choir. Oh, they can join the choir. All right. We've been invited. See, that's the first time I've ever been invited to the choir. And that's a good reason, too, because if you hear me sing. I just want to uh, welcome everyone today. We're glad to have you here. We got a lot going on. We had a lot all weekend. Um, Mr. Roy, I'm going to turn it over to you, and then I know you're going to turn it over to Mr. Mark. So if you want to get ready about our archery tournament here yesterday, if you saw the parking lot was full, it was good time. And it's good to see some of the men that helped yesterday. They made it back today. I didn't, didn't know they would if they, when they were dragging out yesterday. All right. First of all, I want to thank the four men that helped us yesterday. Normally we uh, do it a little differently. Mark gets teachers or so forth. But anyway, I, want to, I said this year's do it different. Let's get the men from the church help. We need to get the church more involved and so they can see, you know, what our archery team is doing. Because the church and the school are actually, you know, they're one. And a lot of our kids here are starting to go there. And just a little history. Back in the day when this was Faith Baptist Church and it was started, they started the school because Christian kids wanted to go have a Christian school. And they had to go out there and be taught in a school that's more so worldly. So a lot of you, if you don't have your kids in a Christian school, you might want to think about that because you see how bad things are going out there in those, in those schools. But I want to thank Myron, uh, Bill Corey, Joe White, and Jim Crawford. And I think we want to give them a big hand. They were here for eight hours. And in the beginning, uh, it looked ugly because they didn't know what to do, and I didn't know what to do either because they had these computerized things. Mark brought us some new stuff to try out, which we used before, but these guys... Uh, they're, they're probably not as computer savvy like I am either. So anyway, they did a real good job and they stayed there all day. I did make them clean up. I uh, said, so y'all can go home now and get on out of here. But so we appreciate what they did. Mr. Crawford. You want to... Yes. They said next time I want a 15 minute break. <laughs> That's true. That's hard. Um, yeah, no, if, actually if they did their better job, we wouldn't have won everything if they did a better job on scoring. But, you know, <laughs> I had to keep them honest. Well, but seriously, um, 
uh, some of the schools that came, uh, there's a big school, two big schools out of top of the Chesapeake Bay that came, and they're public schools. The kids get off the bus cussing and everything else. So uh, hopefully that, you know, we're a good um, testimony to them. We want our, our, you know, just have it at a Christian school. But I think the coach of that team and the coach of another public school that came from Virginia, I believe they're both Christians. Uh, so it's, it's good to see, you know, what kind of influence you can have over other people beyond just having a sport and having uh, the kids have fun. But if you, uh, let's see, if you, and I had a bunch of parents help out yesterday who are go to church here, which I appreciate. So if you helped out in any way yesterday, can you raise your hand? If you helped out your parent or uh, a school, I just want to kind of see how many people in the church kind of helped yesterday, uh, kind of get an idea. So, I mean, that's pretty cool. Uh, and some people not raising their hands. So thank you. Thank you. And then if you are an archer who was here yesterday, why don't you stand up so we can see how many archers on our team go to our church. It's kind of cool, right? Yeah, thank you. All right. All right. Good job. And we got these three in the front standing, too. And then, uh, Mr. Roy, do you remember who of these won uh, medals yesterday? Uh, this young lady got first place, first time at a, at a tournament. Yeah. <laughs> so Roxanne and Sierra, first and second, fourth grade. Yep. First and second, I can't imagine. Fourth grade girls. <laughs> Brennan got first in uh, fourth grade boys, right? Good job. A first tournament. Yep. Uh, Hannah. Where's that? Hannah in the sound booth got first uh, for 12th grade girls, and she got top overall female in tournament. So that's cool. Uh, Christian Silvestri got second place for 11th grade boys, right? Um, good job. So, uh, yeah, that was fun. Yeah, Hannah, Hannah scored 296, right? Out of 300. That's pretty good. All right. That's pretty good. Yeah. So, uh, all right, did I miss anybody who got a medal yesterday? Raise your hand now if I miss you. Who's that? Uh, Marcellus, uh, so you were sixth grade, right? And you were first or second, sixth grade boys. Second place, sixth grade boys, that's good. And that's tough because uh, in middle school, it's tough to compete against some of these big schools. So, uh, and, I, and it was, I appreciate you all who came yesterday, so I don't want to make it long, but did I miss anything? Um, yeah. But thanks a lot. And I, I really do want to thank the church for supporting that program. And hopefully it's a good outreach and it actually affects the kids at our school. So thank you so much. Mr. Roy and Mr. Mark have high hopes for some of these kids in archery and getting scholarships. And uh, so I know Celis is just sixth grade, but he's been shooting very well since fourth grade. And so Mr. Roy uh, made sure yesterday that he took a, a target home. So he's got plans for Celis. So you keep that up, Celis. You're, you're doing good. And these girls, first time out, and Brendan's first time out, and they come home with first, uh, two first and a second. I mean, that's amazing. Because when they say a big school, I'm talking two humongous buses brought them in from one school. So when they jumped off, you're talking 40 kids on a bus at least. So you got a, a archery team of at least 80 and stuff like that. So we're talking. Uh, a big school with lots of money too. So, uh, and we're and we're right up there with them. So, Debbie, I did forget to mention that we had an adult shoot yesterday, which some people took play, took part in, and we kind of thought that our coach would, you know, just come through and win it all, but uh, he got 94 out of 100, but he was beat by the uh, lady from North Carroll. A woman beat him. <laughs> he came in second place, but that's okay. We still love him. <laughs> Uh, he, as soon as I walked in yesterday, he goes, she beat me. <laughs> it's kind of a rivalry. We see him at every tournament, but uh, she rubbed it in during the day, too. So, uh, so it was good. I didn't have to say anything. I just laughed. So. All right. So don't forget we're having the baby sprinkle after. We want to welcome our new one, and it's going to be Bryson Jack, right? And that's maybe, oh, maybe, oh, he didn't clear that through mama, I have a feeling. Okay, so it's going to be baby Clemmy. And uh, so we're going to celebrate baby Clemmy in the back. So, all right. And she made it to December. So all four will most likely be in December babies. So that will be great. So, all right. We want to move on to something serious. And that will be Mr. Roy will be in the back. And for our widow that we're collecting for heat, for our house, we'll be collecting that in the back. You can see Mr. Roy or me, uh, but I go in the back. And uh, Christopher, I believe we have a new first timer, little one, first through sixth grade. We have, how you doing? I miss Debbie and Miss Bruni's. 
I don't know where Miss Rooney. Uh, oh, she's over there with the drums. I'm looking for the drums over there. But um, anyway, we have class first through sixth grade. So everyone, when I when I go out, we go out to children's church, and we have a lot more fun out there. So you, you want to come with us? Um, so we invite you, Christopher, to come with us, and we even have snack. So don't tell don't tell the big kids. All right, so if you want to uh, donate, see Mr. Roy right after or myself when I come back in for the um, baby sprinkle. And then next week, don't forget to bring a uh, dish. We're going to have a potluck dinner, so everybody wants to come and stay. And I know um, right after church, we'll flip this over to a dining hall, and we'll have um, uh, buffets like to go through line, buffet lines to go through, food, lots of food and dessert. So bring a dish and plan to stay right after church next Sunday. And then on the 18th, you don't want to miss that because uh, the choir will have their cantata and that's always a good time too as well. And uh, the kids will be in the back and uh, having their uh, happy birthday Jesus. So on Christmas Day, Actually, Christmas Eve, there will be a ceremony, I mean, a, a service, Christmas Eve service from 6 to 7 right here in the chapel on Christmas Eve. And then Christmas Day, we will only have 11 o'clock service. So there'll be no 10 o'clock Sunday school. We'll just have church service at 11, from 11 to 12. And no Sunday school at 10. And, and no chili on next Sunday. So. Okay. Just so we have enough, Pastor uh, always augments it with a few other items. So if you have time to do, be happy. All right. And then on Christmas Day, we'll also have cookies and hot chocolate on your way out, so you want to come and have fellowship for that. All right. And at this time, we'll do uh, some of our raffle. So here's your bucket. Everybody got a ticket? When you came in, did you get you a ticket? No. They do not. Mr. Myron, can you give tickets right here? Over there too. Oh, okay. We uh, Debbie Roberts and they don't. We got quite a few that don't have tickets. Raise your hand. Right. Yep. Yeah. Ladies, if you weren't in class this morning, Miss Maureen taught, and we had a great class, so you don't want to miss it. She started a series on Advent, so you, uh, it was really good, and we look forward to the next couple weeks that she's going to be teaching us. It starts at 10 in the music room. All right, everybody got a ticket yet? Raise your hand if you don't have a ticket yet. We got it. I think we got it. Yep, good job. Okay. He's in. All right. Good job. Okay. Here we go. You mix them up good. Okay. All right. Our first one for our beautiful point setter. Last three digits are eight nine nine. Eight nine nine. There we go, Miss Nancy. <laughs> All right, Olivia the orchid is going next. All right, last three digits, 902, 902. Right there we go, Mr. DeHaven. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. All right, our next one is a box of cookies. Goes to 925, 925, 925. There, Miss Lorraine, 925. All three of these. Yeah. Okay, uh, the next one goes to 933. 933, right there we go, Andy. Two weeks in a row, Andy, good job. All right. And our last box of cookies goes to 887. 887, right there, sell is. All right. Oh, okay. Yes, ma'am. Our first card, 
$25 goes to Olive Garden. It goes to ticket number 703. 703 in the back. There we go, 703. Our next one is $25 to Outback, and it goes to ticket 708. 708. Somebody has it, 708. All right, go on once. Check your tickets, 708. Nobody up front? I'm going to raise ticket number. I'll take it. <laughs> Goes to 936. Right there, 936. All right. All right. And our $50 Wawa goes to, drum roll, Miss Bruni. 712. 712. All the way in the back, Miss Judy. All right. All right, and um, I'm sure a certain person thinks that we forgot that her birthday is this week, on Tuesday to be a matter of fact. So, Miss Jen, come on down. I just want to say one thing. Her and um, Hannah, her sister, they've taken on the archery to, to raise funds, and they're doing a great job. But when I go by, she'll usually, if Roy's donated cakes or something, she gives me something sweet to eat, and I don't have to pay. So I probably just mess that up. So anyway, y'all pray for me. All right, we're going in the back for first through sixth grade. Thank you, Ms. Debbie. Please stand with us. It came upon the midnight clear That glorious song of old From angels bending near the earth To touch their harps of gold Be so Bell. 
seated. Thank you, choir. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the season, and we thank you for your love toward us. We thank you for the cross, Calvary, your birth. What an amazing time we're living in. We just pray your blessings. In your name, Lord Jesus, we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Uh, I want to talk uh, to you today about the last words of God's people. And I want to say, I thought I was seeing double, but Amy, you're going to have a baby, aren't you? <laughs> What's the due date? Two months ago, I'm just kidding. It's not actually due until the fourth of January, but every one of their due dates are around that same time. And every one of them, the 11th, the 21st, and the 26th. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Any time. Any time. <laughs> Listen, the final words of people before they die are usually the most powerful and the most honest. Some express words of fear, dread of death. Some frustration or defeat, others. I remember one lady about to die, and I was talking to her, and I said um, she didn't know she was going to die. But uh, according to the family, I knew she was. And uh, I, I mentioned uh, passing away someday, and she said, oh, I can't leave here now. She said, I have some people I need to talk to. And... Um, we, we never know when we're going, do we? Uh, some frustration or defeat. Others express words of love and tenderness. Does anybody remember the actor Michael Landon? Very popular with a Bonanza and the Little House on the Prairie and uh, uh, died of cancer in 1991. His family gathered around his bed and his son said, Dad, it's time to move on. And Michael said, you're right, it's time. I love you all, and he died. John Wayne died at 72 in L.A., and he turned to his wife and said, of course I know who you are. You're my girl. I love you, and gave up his last breath. Sir Arthur Doyle, who wrote Sherlock Holmes stories, um, died at 71, uh, in his garden, and he turned to his wife and said, you are wonderful. He clutched his chest and died. I don't know, this just doesn't look right. Let me try that, there we go. 
All right. Johnny Crown, her granddaddy, um, was uh, in the hospital. He came home. And my wife happened to be there in Florida with her sister, Johnny's wife, Debbie. And jo Donna and Debbie were sitting on the couch. And Johnny sat in between them. And he said, it sure is good to be home. And those were his last words. It sure is good to be home. And we talked about that quite a bit. He was a strong Christian man. And we thought, now, maybe he wasn't seeing what they were seeing. Maybe the Lord was about ready to take him home. We know we serve a great God who's going to be there with us as Christians when we get ready to leave. Amen. Now let's look at the last words of Paul. Uh, he was definitely a fighter. He was definitely one of our champions as we read Scripture. In 2 Timothy 4, we read, hold on one second. Okay. <clears throat> I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come uh, when they will not endure sound doctrine. And I do believe that is today. Those Christians who have been faithful to the Lord will receive his reward, and those who have not been faithful uh, will have salvation but no rewards. And life is going by so quickly. Romans 14, 12 says, So then everyone shall give an account of himself to the Lord. And the Bible also says that as your pastor, one day I will give an account of you. And so you want to make sure that I'm able to do that with joy. Amen? And, and love and encouragement. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You have been bought. You are not your own. We're not our own. Moving on. 1 Corinthians 10.31, Whether therefore you eat, or drink, or whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God. You know, I, I've always prayed before I eat, but I thought to myself reading that, maybe I need to be praying even when I drink water. <laughs> Are you all with me? Whatever we do, do it all to the glory of God. What a God we serve. Paul does his best to make each day count for the Lord and we should do the same. Amen? Amen? Ephesians 5 says, fifteen says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Respectly means to be on the Look out. Amen? Paul said, preach the word. I love those words, don't you? Point number one today, preach the word. Tuesday at my dentist's office, uh, I, when, when I go there, it seems like I'm always in a rush. When I get there, I want to talk to them, but I've got my mouth wide open, and they got shovels and screwdrivers and all that stuff <laughs> cleaning my teeth. Do you know what I'm saying? And, but I had it planned. I got there a half hour early. And I planned my morning with them. Amen. With uh, Agnes. Agnes, yeah. And so um, um, I'm talking to the lady that cleans my teeth. And I said, oh, I love Thanksgiving. Did you have a good Thanksgiving? And she said, yes, I really did. And I said, well, I want to give you my favorite Thanksgiving track. Now, I have to be confessed to you. All of those tracks are my favorites. But I love this one because it's got a picture. It says the Romans Road. And it's got a picture of a road. It really looks like a road, but then it goes straight up. And she said, the Romans Road. She said, what city is that in? 
she had no idea it was a gospel track. But um, we did have a wonderful time talking about that. And I talked about some of our men here, how God has blessed them and used them mightily in our lives. Preaching must be marked by three elements, conviction, warning, and appeal. Or just like Paul said, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. To get a quote, uh, an old rule of preachers, to quote old uh, rules of preachers, they said that they should afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. That covers all bases, doesn't it? Dr. John MacArthur tells of a beautiful French girl who was born blind. After she had learned to read Braille by touch, they say that she read so much that her fingers became calloused and insensitive. While trying to regain her feelings, she cut the calluses off her fingers, uh, which gave her permanent, more insensitive fingers. Sobbing, she gave her Bible a farewell kiss. That's when she discovered her lips were more sensitive than even her fingers were. And she spent the rest of her life reading her great treasure, the Bible, the Word of God, with her lips. What a blessing. Can I get another amen? Another man heard this very story. And he was severely injured from an explosion. He lost both hands and his eyesight. And he was a new Christian, and his lips were also very damaged. But he discovered uh, he could read Braille, the Bible, by using his tongue. Isn't that amazing? And, and it was said that at the time of the interview, he had already read the Bible through four times with his tongue. Wow. Lord, may we have the same hunger for your word as these two. Psalm 119, 11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Praise God. His word is everything. Jeremiah 15, 16, Thy words were found. Are you all listening to me? Okay. Thy words were found and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. I love that. His word was the joy and the rejoicing of his heart. Isn't that a blessing? I remember when my wife and I had, my wife had gotten saved, and I had not. But in bed at night, she started reading her Bible. And I'm here to tell you, it convicted me bad. All I could do was open my eye up and look over at her reading. I mean, it was conviction. But I'm so thankful for two men on visitation showing me how to be saved, and I got saved that night. And they say in Soul Winning 101, if you're there more than a half hour, you're wasting your time. These two guys came in my house at 7. They left at around midnight. If you're there more than a half hour, you're wasting your time. What I'm showing you is that's how slow I am. Are you with me? Uh, but praise God, that night I got saved. They thought I prayed and asked the Lord to save me to get rid of them. But now I've had the privilege to preach to uh, one that just went to heaven. I can't wait to see him someday. Moving on. Romans 12, 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. As you get in the word, the word gets into you, and your lives are changed forever. The word renews our minds. Back to Paul, 2 Timothy 4.2. First of all, the first point, preach the word. I've preached a whole lot of things except the word, but I know now as I'm growing older, what means anything, the word. Uh, Paul said, point number two, be instant in season and out of season. Instant means to be ready, be prepared, having a sense of urgency. 
Paul's readiness enabled him to live in victory. First Peter tells us, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. I've, I've had times where I was not ready to give an answer. And it's amazing how God will put people in your life. I remember one guy was asking me all these questions about Christianity, and I just was not ready for them. This is years ago. And uh, so I'm ready today. Can I get an amen? And yesterday, we had two young men at uh, Jude House ask the Lord Jesus to forgive them and to save them. Amen. Amen? We prepare ourselves for ministry by doing several things. I like these four C's. Communicating with the Lord. In other words, pray without ceasing. We need to pray. I'm telling you, before you go out of the house, uh, when you're ready to go to bed, you need to pray. One of the joys of my heart is my little grand, great-grandson, Aiden. Uh, thank, and I'm very thankful, by the way, for uh, Colleen Gaines and Linda Bays over there on the other side, way over there on the other side. But they are amazing. They have taught this little boy I mean, they have a way of teaching him. She has a big treasure chest. And when he does well, he can open the treasure chest and pull out little cars that I'd like to play with myself. Are you all with me? <laughs> and, uh, but he tickled me so much. I guess that was uh, Friday. Uh, my wife is in a lot of pain, and, and my uh, grandson says, Grandma, let's pray. And he prays for my grandmother. I'm my grandmother. <laughs> he did not pray for my grandmother. He prayed for my wife. And then she said, well, Aiden, you, you've been sick. He said, let's pray for me. <laughs> and, and he started praying for himself, which I thoroughly enjoyed. So we know we want to pray without ceasing. And then concentrating on scripture. Uh, the Bible says, I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. Another word starts with C is clearing, cleaning our conscience. Always have a conscience, the Bible says, void of offense toward God and men. Another word is conforming, conforming to God's word. Uh, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. So point number two, we want to be instant, in season, and out of season. I will tell you, we need to prepare. Uh, when we're speaking to people, if you have a few minutes, uh, be sure to get prayed up. Um, point number three today, full proof thy ministry. Paul said that also. Uh, or perform your purpose. First Timothy 4, again, 5 through 7 says, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full, thy, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Full proof means to fulfill or carry out. Paul brought to completion the purpose of his life. How are you going to do Do you feel that you have a goal or goals and a purpose in your life? I certainly do mine. And I believe many of you do too. Paul said, I fought a good fight. What fight? I'm glad you asked. Uh, we fight against the flesh every day. This is a constant battle, a battle worth fighting. We fight against the flesh. Galatians 6 tells me, This I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Uh, verse 17 
I love this verse, and I'll tell you why. I think of these last ver words. I've invited people to church, and people will say, Pastor, I will be there Sunday. A Sunday morning comes, and I mean, I really believe in my heart. They meant that. But when Sunday morning comes, something else happens. And I'm telling you, that Satan is alive and well. I remember my niece, um, Linda Barton, um, she had just gotten saved, and she said, uh, I told her this verse. I'm going to read it to you, and then I'll tell you the rest of the story. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. You cannot do the things that you would. I'm here to tell you, she decided she was coming to church no matter what. So she went over to her girlfriend's house and picked her up. And they were going to come to the church the first time. And I'll never forget, she had a little Honda, straight stick. And the car wouldn't start. And she remembered me giving her that verse, that the things that, so that you cannot do the things that you would. So her and her girlfriend got out in high heels and started pushing that car down the road and jump-started it, came to church, and God blessed her so much. Uh, I introduced her to a fellow at church that was redneck and uh, <laughs> from my background, you know what I mean? And uh, I'll never forget, those two fell in love. And she had a big job in the government, uh, and, and uh, she felt the Lord leading her, so she quit her government job, and she became a school teacher at Riverdale Baptist. And uh, I'm, the salary, I know, was much, much cheaper than what she was making there. But then the Lord blessed her and her husband. They started buying houses, selling houses, and uh, I call her my tycoon niece. Are you with me? And, uh, but uh, make foolproof your ministry. I forgot where I was. Um, oh, oh, I know where I was. <laughs> Verse 17. Anybody in here awake? Yeah. I'll wake up in a few minutes. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to another that you cannot do the things that you would. What do we fight? We fight the flesh. We fight against sin. Romans 6.23 says, The wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. And I have seen that in the lives of God's people. We fight against, we fight for men's souls. Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. God, I'm here to tell you, has a purpose and a plan for you. Fulfilling it will help you to become a uh, victorious Christian. Joshua put it this way. Uh, and if it seemed to be evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, he said, we will serve the Lord. Isn't that good? There's a plaque you can buy at Christian bookstores, and it has that verse on it. I remember when we got saved, uh, we were so proud of that plaque, and my wife had me put it on our front door. I like that, don't you? I like having Bible verses in your house. I know one preacher that um, he uh, said when he was growing up that his parents would put Bible verses, they would put glue on the walls in their house and then throw sprinkles on them. That's a little drastic, but uh, it's okay if it works. Amen. And he became a preacher. So that ought to tell you something. All right. Having a purpose helps us stand for the Lord. I remember when I started, when the Lord started Tuesday Night Live Bible study with young people at my home. And uh, for over 15 years, we averaged over 100 in my house every Tuesday. 
And um, at the beginning, I never knew who was coming. So that meant I had to study. It wasn't optional. I did not know who was coming to our house. It's sort of like on Sunday morning. I don't know who's coming. But um, so I would have to study. And that was a blessing for me, uh, being able to read God's word and to serve him. Having a purpose helps us to stand for the Lord. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abad, uh, Abednego. Does anybody remember Tony Evans? You know, it's not skin, it's sin. That's what my preacher used to say. It's not black and white, it's sin as our problem. And Tony Evans, the great uh, black preacher from the radio, he always says, Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro. <laughs> but he is a wonderful man of God, amen? And remember, it's not skin anyway, it's sin. That's our problem. <clears throat> uh, they proposed to, they, propo they had purposed to honor and serve the Lord. Daniel 3, 17, they told the king, the Lord is able to deliver us out of thy hand, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image. And they were thrown into the fiery furnace. And the king looked in the next morning, and he said, we threw three in the furnace, but there's four in there now and the fire has given them no hurt. And he said, and the fourth looks like the Son of God. Oh yeah. And you know, I'm convinced that the Bible doesn't say that the three in that fiery furnace saw the Lord in there with them. This is really important to me. They didn't, it didn't say he saw them, but a lot of times when we're going through trials, uh, we don't know, we don't see the Lord, we're looking for him. But I'm here to tell you, he's there. He will never leave us or forsake us. Can I get an amen? amen? Having a purpose helps us to straighten out our lives. How many people have I seen going this way or now coming this way? Anybody remember the prodigal son? That's a great story, isn't it? And when he came to himself, he hadn't been himself. And remember, he had gotten his father's inheritance, half of it, and wasted on riotous living. And he said, I will arise and go to my father. And I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am no more worthy to be called thy son. And I love these next verses. But his father said, bring forth the best robe. I put a ring on my son's finger. My son that was dead is alive again. Oh, happy day. Can I get an amen? One more amen. amen. Point number three. No, wait a minute. Point number four. Fight the good fight. I want to tell you, this battle is a good fight. There's nothing like telling people about the Lord. Uh, seeing lives changed. It's a battle, but it's a good battle. He said, I fought a good fight. He was beaten all those times. Once left for, I believe he was dead, and came back, and then he went right back into the same town and preached again. That must have been a good fight. Are you all with me? Listen, um, I like Psalm 126, verses 5 and 6. They that sow in tears have a heart for souls shall reap in joy I'm telling you there's nothing this is a good fight this is fun he that goeth forth on weeping with a burdened heart bearing precious sh seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing bringing his sheaves or his people with him we have seen that uh, today, I had a good time. I went into Dunkin' Donuts and I had my trash. I had, uh, it wasn't uh, the Romans Road, but it was something else.
But I told a lady my testimony very quickly. I said, you know, I lost four children. I got in the Bible, and the Lord changed my life. And, uh, and I said, and now we have four, almost 400 kids in the school, and I'm just bragging on the Lord. She said, I'm not religious. And, and we'd already prayed, Aiden and I, Marissa, you, were, you weren't with me that, at that time. Okay. Um, she said, I'm not religious. And I said, you may not be now. I said, but one day you will and you will stand before the Lord and you'll find out that the Bible was true after all. And there is a heaven and there is a hell. And she was shocked. And I was shocked it came out of my mouth. Are you all with me? <laughs> but uh, I look forward to seeing her again. But, you know, that word hell, I remember Alan Ryman. I'm saying that because Joan Hall knows just who I'm talking about, a great preacher. Um, he used to come to my shop all the time. And he said to me as kindly as he could, Marvin, you're on your way to hell. I said, Alan, you have ruined my day. And I was probably bragging about something I shouldn't have been. But I will tell you that I'll never forget him saying those words to me. And I'm thankful to this day that he did because I needed to hear it. Who wants to die and go to hell without Jesus forever? Someone, I remember a preacher preaching, and he said, people that die without Jesus and go to hell will spend all eternity looking for a light switch that they'll never find. How sad. And the fact that we've had people that have witnessed to people and people that have laughed back at them. Um, I've told you about my friend Jim Rollins. Um, went into his house, tell him about Jesus, and I was excited. I was having a good time. I was picking a good fight. Do you remember Jimmy Rollins? And uh, he said, Marvin, if you were anybody else, I'd throw you out of my house right now. And I didn't care. We were blood. We were close. We were friends. And then after a while, I got the picture that he was really serious. So uh, I said, okay, Jimmy. So I went home, and, and uh, he was, I guess, upset with me. But the blessing is his wife came to church. And she got saved, and her son got saved. And by the way, now, he, you knew the Rollinses, didn't you? And, um, and you knew Shelly, his wife. Do you know Shelly? Sister, sister-in-law. Yeah. She uh, got saved, and then eventually Jimmy died. But she went to North Carolina and started teaching in a Sunday school and has been teaching ever since. I remember the day she got saved, she said, Pastor, I've tried everything else. Uh, Marvin, I've tried everything else, and I'm going to try Jesus. So she went forward and got saved. But her husband, Jimmy, the next year called me, or I called him to tell him the same story. we got a story to tell. Uh, preach the word. Amen. And I started talking to him again, and, and he said, I'll never forget. He said, Marvin, what was that verse? I said, why do you want to know what the verse is? He said, because I'm writing it down. He wanted to throw me out a year before. Now he's writing the verses down. Don't tell me that, that um, we're not fighting a good fight. We got a story to tell. We have a purpose in life. Are you with me? A purpose. Be instant in season out of season, foolproof your ministry, preach the word. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. If you've been encouraged by God's word, would you slip your hand up? Anybody like that? Several hands, you can put them down. Uh, maybe there's a decision in your life you need to make today. Maybe you haven't been uh, sharing the word with people. I want to challenge you. The greatest days of your life can lie ahead 
when you be a witness for the Lord Jesus, not about us, it's all about him. Anybody that's ever been saved has a great testimony. And uh, maybe you have a burden, maybe while, while I'm talking, you see a friend in your mind, someone that you know you need to witness to. If you do with heads bowed and eyes closed, would you just slip your arm, Pastor, I have a friend that needs Jesus. Is there someone like that here? Amen, I see that hand there. Anybody else? Amen, amen. Would you men come forward and let us pray for that person as we give this hymn of invitation? Amen, amen. Maybe you're here and you're not saved, you need Jesus. What a great time of the year to accept him as your savior. I just pray, if you're not saved, you would see us afterward and let us take the word of God and show you how to be saved. As Ray sings this hymn of invitation, uh, if you're almost persuaded to step out for any reason, take that first step. The other steps will be easy. Oh, soul, are you weary? and troubled no light in the darkness you see there's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free turn your eyes upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace Thank you, Brother Ray. We're not going to bother these that are praying. Uh, Jeremy, would you close us in a word of prayer? Dear God, thank you for allowing us all to gather today in your name. Please allow us to leave today after hearing the words and allow us to help spread that word to the folks that definitely need to hear it. And that's everybody. So thank you for everything that you've done. And thank you for everything that you will do and continue to do for all of us. In these, in your beautiful name, we pray. Jesus. Amen. Thank you, brother. Everybody, let's shake hands with somebody. There's some visitors here, first-time visitors back here. Be sure to uh, make them feel at home.